Hi everyone, I'm Franco and I lead the, the game design and, and data consulting team at Unity. And I'm also joined here today uh, by Erke, uh, who's co-founder of uh, Unico Studio. Uh, and in this session, we'll be covering how to improve your core loop and drive long-term retention. So let's get started. So the agenda for today, um, we're gonna cover a few topics here. Um, we're going to talk around uh, the transformation of the game, games industry over the past uh, five or so years. Um, why is making a long-lived game important? Free-to-play game life cycle. Um, and we're going to cover some best practices um, as uh, RK has uh, provided some uh, examples from, from his uh, studio's games. So we'll look at some best practices there and then we'll, we'll finish off with some key takeaways. So let's get cracking. All right, this slide needs a tiny bit of context. So those of you that don't know, in late 2019, Unity acquired a company called Delta DNA, who are a, a player engagement, analytics, and consultancy solution, tailored specifically for the games industry. And that's when, uh, well, that's where I joined Unity. At Delta DNA, we tracked a selection of over 100 free-to-play games for, for half a decade, and we used it to monitor trends. We devised this index that consolidates the best bits of games. So looking at conversion, retention, uh, and other areas as well. And the data was anchored to 2016. So over the past four or, or more years, games we've been seeing have, have been improving. So under the hood, uh, retention is improving. So better games are being released, uh, focus, focusing on the, the player experience. Um, and there's more knowledge of best practices. So LTV is much more predictable. User acquisition spend is a far better control and ads are being implemented in a much more intuitive way, uh, which is really improving the reputation because obviously, as we know, ads uh, in the past um, had been implemented fairly poorly uh, and there's been a lot of learning over the years. Um, so, uh, Erkai, how has your journey been over the past few years? Do you second these trends or, or do you have any commentary to add here? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Franco. Uh... You, you summarize really uh, really good way um, yeah I, I totally agree with you uh, this is uh, very similar to our journey in the last couple of years uh, we are absolutely observe almost the same uh, the same things in the industry and uh, I, I can add uh, that uh, the uh, the gaming industry is becoming much uh, much more competitive each year um, especially in the mobile gaming. Uh, great titles are released each year and the acquisition costs, costs are increase, increasing with increased competition. Um, so you should get most value from each one of the users playing your game uh, by uh, trying to increase retention and engagements. Uh, and also, what can I say uh, is the ads. Uh, as you said, uh, we, we uh, started to see ads in almost every game genre, um, even from uh, the uh, mid-core games or even some core games, we started to see ads. Uh, so it is a big change, I think, that we observe in the last couple of years. Um, also, one thing that, uh, as you said, uh, the players uh, are spending more, uh, uh, especially uh, the millennials and the new generations. Uh, which which born into the new technologies, uh, the uh, the mobile phones with everything, so they they are tend tend to spend more uh, to the games. We can observe that. Uh, so this is this this was an uh, interesting thing. Uh, our generations are more conservative, or the older generations. Uh, so maybe the last thing that I can add is the uh, the data, is becoming much much more important. Um, now we have a lot of data. Um, but uh, the thing is, uh, the, the developers or the game companies uh, who can uh, analyze and manage and uh, observe the, the data uh, is going to be successful in the, uh, in the coming years. Perfect. No, thanks for that. Um, that's really, really insightful. Great. So we'll move on to the next slide now. You don't need us to tell you that, that games have been improving over the years. If we take the top grossing game charts, so we've been looking at sort of Apptopia, so iOS, um, uh, US, and, and APAC, the majority of the charts consist of, of games older than one year. 
And if you just look at the top 100, half are older than three years. So it's very clear that, that long-lived games are, are dominating. So the big question here is, why is making long-lived games important? And let's look at the Delta DNA stats for, for long-lived games. And again, this is iOS, and we're looking globally here. We've seen over 70% of revenue come from players who are over one month old. And that means the best games are nurturing their players for months to build up their value. And when we're looking at the free-to-play game life cycle, traditionally uh, games, so if you're talking sort of premium box games, studios that make one game and then move on to the next, um, so they're kind of peaking revenue on launch and then tailing off after uh, a few months, uh, visualized here by the, the number one kind of blue line here. And now taking that, we're, we've seen similar trends in, in free-to-play, where all the effort uh, and money is put into the launch of the game, and the game uh, or the studio never really recovers after they get out of the gates. And what's interesting is more and more games are, are trying to follow this second trend. So they've got a slow burn investment with the game growing at a more sustainable pace. So in, in short, what we're trying to say here is if you're making a game, it's really important to, to think about falling into the second trend here. Um, Hyper casual is a little bit different. It's maybe a different conversation, um, but it's, it's interesting in terms of the split that we see here in our data um, and, and the, the benefit of following the second trend. So, um, Arke, I'll, I'll ask you another question here. So looking at these two trends, do you have a similar outlook when it comes to production? And, and what have your kind of launch experiences uh, been like? Uh, uh, thanks, Franco. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, uh, everybody wants games in the, in the group too. Uh, so it's, it's much better graph, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can say that uh, some, some of our titles is in the group too, uh, especially the ones that are um, more close to, you know, mid-core or casual, uh, like word games or more classic titles. Uh, you can observe the uh, increase um, in the revenues or uh, daily active users, monthly active users by time, especially after the uh, big updates, important updates. Uh, uh, but some of our games are, uh, I don't want to say that they are in group one, but um, some of the games, some of our games are between one and two because uh, especially like the uh, between casual and hyper casual titles, as you said, you know the hyper casual titles are mostly in the group one because uh, the game loop, the core loop is very very tiny. Uh, you cannot improve it, so the users are just playing for a, for a while, maybe one or two days or a week. So what uh, what we are trying to achieve is to have games in group two, but yeah, of course, in uh, depending on the games. Um, genre, it, it might de uh, be in, uh, you know, between one and two. Perfect. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And, and, and especially when you're making your first game, um, yes. a, lot, a lot of sort of input and thought can go around uh, in terms of making the, the game as comprehensive as possible. And also, there's a big risk in that. Yeah. Also, it, it, it is a strategy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, making and developing games in group two is is a little bit harder. Also, is is uh, you know requires more uh, time to make the games. Yeah. Um, so you have to make a, you know successful soft launch, um, a, a long term for soft launch. So you have to optimize the game during that launch. Also, you have to constantly improve improve the game. So if you have a game like uh, in Group Two, it, it is it is really valuable. So you have you should stick on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, that that also means that. Uh, probably you will not make you know more games uh, in the short term because it will take a lot of time to, yeah. to deal with that game. So before we look at um, some examples of, of long-term engagement examples, a little bit of a disclaimer um, is having great in engagement mechanics uh, in place are, are, are not a silver bullet. So you really need to have a good game first. Uh, and what I mean by that is have your just make sure that your your onboarding or the core gameplay loop isn't flawed 
or the game's underperforming in the early gameplay phases. So say it's too punishing, just poor UI or UX, it's really important to um, establish the problems early and, and fix them first. So ideally, you want to nail and prove the fundamentals at soft launch um, and balance the difficulty and economy uh, and whatnot and really use analytics and understand your players um, yeah, and really get to know them. And then once you've kind of sorted that out, it's then it's time to worry about the mechanics that effectively take you from month one uh, to month six and beyond. So as I mentioned at the start, Erky has kindly provided some examples from his games to use as a, as a discussion point. And on the left here, we have some daily rewards from Brain Test 2 and Word, per word Perils. Erky, did, did you have these, these uh, mechanics implemented uh, at the at launch of the game? Uh, or were these implemented after? And if they were implemented after, what kind of impact did they have on your players? So yeah, I can say that they are implemented uh, after the launch. Um, uh, because during the soft launch, we mostly focus on the core uh, game loop um, instead of these kind of uh, engagement increasing uh, improvements. So uh, after the soft launch, we try to improve uh, the retention, the engagements with uh, like daily rewards and other things that we're going to talk on. Uh, for uh, daily rewards, uh, as we can see for Brain Test 2 and World Purse, um, it is a very simple mechanic to implement, but it is very helpful to increase the retention values for the games. I can say, you know, after implementing a uh, daily reward mechanic to the game, it, uh, it increases the retention, um, you know, at least 5 to 10%. So it, it, is, it is a huge impact. So yeah. people really like this. Sometimes we think, you know, let's let's uh, skip this daily reward thing, and uh, then we notice that oh, it's it's a huge impact on the retention. So we implement it, um, and we also get a lot of reviews if we if we skip it. You know, people say, oh, there should be some daily rewards. Why not? You are not giving a daily reward. So uh, th this this is really important. Uh, the daily rewards is really easy to implement, and uh, you gain a lot. Uh, especially from the retention uh, point of view. Uh, for daily tasks, uh, this is mostly for the engagement uh, and in to increase the session duration uh, because while uh, improving the game and um, uh, the, the most important thing is to keep players in the game because if they are in the game, they are spending money and uh, bringing revenue. So uh, daily tasks, uh, is a great tool um, to keep the players uh, playing in the game, like uh, complete 10 levels yeah. uh, or uh, reach to level 50. So you always reset this value each day so people can keep uh, you know, uh, doing these tasks uh, each day, which is, which is also you know, an easy, easy thing to implement. And if your game is... Uh, suitable for this, it, it's great to implement daily tasks. No, they're really, really powerful mechanics. So um, just to build on um, your answers there, so looking at the, the daily rewards, um, and we all know they're kind, kind of quite commonplace and a really good mechanic to have um, that really encourages repeat play. Um, but I'd just like to add sort of a sort of an, an uh, sort of extra insight um, from the experience that, that I've had uh, looking at, at a lot of games over the years. Um, and, that, and how important it is to, to kind of reward for a consecutive play. So sometimes games use like a reward calendar or incremental rewards as it gives a better sense of urgency to return to the game each day. Each day. Uh, and it can also act as a solid reminder um, for players once they've left the game that, oh, I better check in tomorrow because I'm going to get something special um, for doing so. Um, and obviously looking, sort of going on to daily tasks now, um, and what you've done with Word City, which is great. Um, it's a really good extension to, to daily rewards. And these can really be used to prevent players from just logging in and claiming the rewards and then leaving again. It's encouraging the players to come in. Yeah, they'll claim the daily reward, but they can earn additional, rewar additional rewards by engaging in the gameplay. 
if we look at the example that we've got on the right here from Word City, um, which features a list of tasks, and I believe they'll, I assume they'll reset every 24 hours. Um, and sorry, just a side question as well. Was this, this mechanic implemented post-launch as well, or was this something that you had um, prior to launch? Uh, it, is, it is also post-launch. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, uh, we saw you know, substantial uh, amount of increases in the engagement and session uh, duration. Great. So, yeah, some, some additional kind of notes before we move on to the next slide in regards to daily task. The daily task is that, again, just to highlight how powerful they actually are, so not only do daily objectives promote consecutive play as well, it promotes engagements as players need to actually do something to actually earn the reward. So from mm -hmm. the early game, these daily objectives can help teach the player the best way to play without holding their hand too much. So it can really be an effective tool in terms of onboarding as well, um, or even surfacing new mechanics um, or gameplay elements that are unlocked over time. So they can be really used as a really kind of powerful onboarding mechanic as well. Um, because sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating if the game is too much on rails or they're led through multiple screens and they're not actually engaging in the content. So it can be a real subtle but really effective way um, to onboard later on in the game. Another key benefit is it can be a powerful mechanic to manage sessionization. Um, so once tasks are complete, um, players stop earning as many rewards. So they're feeling sort of a natural break point um, to leave the game um, and come back later. Uh, and this helps really prevent burnout. So with players leaving the game on a, on a positive note with a clear reminder to return the following day because they're going to have increased rewards. So it is a natural kind of pinch point without forcing players out of the game. Uh, and one thing I advocate is obviously not having any um, sort of monetization blockers or having any sort of uh, blockers in place that prevents the player enjoying uh, the game. Um, simply reducing the amount of resources that the player can earn um, after a certain period of time allowing them to still engage with the core gameplay. Um, it just really acts as a natural sort of break point, as I say, um, and daily tasks can really facilitate that. So following on nicely from the previous slide, we've got some interesting insights into the positive effect of, of sort of a daily task system. Um, and in this case study, we're talking about sort of daily missions. Um, and a puzzle game on the Delta DNA platform that introduced these sort of daily missions um, we saw a really positive increase in retention when comparing its stats to before this mechanic was actually implemented. And a comparable um, game from the same developer uh, in this, uh, you, this uh, case study um, that didn't host any daily challenges um, saw its retention rates drop significantly uh, over the same period of time. While this was uh, a good use case for daily, um, daily tasks, simply sort of tacking on a daily task system into your game won't give you the results that you want. Uh, performance will really depend on how well this system is implemented in your game. It's essential to host the kind of proper onboarding to the task system. So if it's hidden away and the player might overlook it, it might not be as effective as, as, um, as you originally thought. It needs to have a good design, um, be easily accessible, signposted, um, have balanced rewards, and really the list goes on. So in short, it's not easy to implement a really solid sort of task system, but if it is implemented correctly, it can have a really positive effect on retention uh, and the player experience as well. So I'm going to pass over to, to Arkai now um, to talk a little, about, uh, a little bit about Brain Test 2 um, and how important sort of difficulty balancing is and how we utilised um, the data to understand where there could be um, an issue uh, in the game uh, and how that was over overcome. So I'll pass over to you to, to, to go over uh, this, this slide. Uh, thank you, Franco. Uh, th this is the funnel analysis of brain test tube uh, in one of the stories. Uh, so this, this is, I think, extremely important uh, to discuss. Um, we can see uh, a huge drop in one of the levels. Uh, after the level six. So people are uh, starting level seven, but they are not uh, finishing it. So uh, it is a good uh, sign of a problem at that level. 
so we uh, made an analysis. So what might be the problem? So we found that uh, this is, you know, uh, in the early levels of the game, but it is a very difficult level. So uh, people are dropping at this level and we are losing our uh, players at the very beginning of the game. So what we made is to uh, change this level, update it to an easier version. So uh, we saw a huge uh, uplift uh, in the, uh, on the players that are uh, passing to the level seven. So uh, it also improves the retention uh, because people are not uh, people that who are not uh, able to pass level uh, one level uh, are not going to come to the game again. Also improve the engagement and the session durations, uh, which will they will keep playing in the uh, the game for a long time. So the funnel analysis is a must. I mean, uh, if you if your game is uh, a level-based game especially, uh, you have to make a final analysis uh, and you have to detect the levels that are causing problems and uh, you have to update them. Uh, I can say th this is a specific example for brain test 2, but we had uh, a lot of other analysis uh, with the Unity's final analysis tool. Um, and we saw that some levels might be difficult, uh, some it required uh, very small items uh, that player need to engage, which cause drops in the levels. So we improve that levels. Uh, some levels uh, required some phone interactions to pass the levels, and we saw that some uh, Android phones, you know, some uh, problems with these kind of interactions. So uh, these all helped us a lot to improve our game. And uh, at the end of the day, we saw a huge increase in, uh, on the retention values and uh, on engagement values. So uh, I, I can recommend these uh, funnel analysis to all, all the developers, all the game companies um, to, to, um, to make. Great. And this really kind of goes back to what we were saying uh, on a previous slide, where it's really important to, to understand your players and, uh, and use analytics to to kind of get under the hood and find these kind of problem areas and, and running funnels like this is really kind of fundamental uh, mm -hmm. in terms of ensuring that not only the kind of early game um, sort of retention um, is, is performing as it should be and making sure there's no gaps or any significant drops um, as seen here, but even looking sort of deeper into the game in terms of your mid game players or your late game players, what kind of drop off points are they hitting? Is there a certain threshold in the game where the, there's not enough content to keep them engaged. Um, do you need to look at sort of... So yeah, if you're looking at your kind of late game players, um, if the players are maybe consuming content too quickly, it can be a really good indicator in terms of having to kind of ramp up um, producing some more content for the game. So if it's level-based, um, creating more buckets of levels and dripping them in um, at a more kind of steady pace, if you've kind of got a, a big bucket of, of late game players to keep them happy so it really is at all stages of the player life cycle to really kind of analyze your data and make sure that there isn't any kind of significant um, points in, in the game's design that could be causing uh, players to defect. Okay now as we come into our final slide here we're just going to cover some of the key takeaways from from the, the short talk that we've, we've hosted today. So look at these top two points here um, and they really kind of go together and what we're saying here in terms of um, player retention and engagement being um, really kind of uh, critical elements to uh, a game's long-term success uh, and around about the kind of components um, of your game mechanics um, with retention in mind. So harking back to what we mentioned about it being important to ensure the fundamentals of your game are sound before um, putting in too much money, time uh, and effort into your game's launch and really proving that you have a good game first through soft launch and adequate testing, player analysis, and then building your game from there. Um, and you can't really predict how players are, are going to consume your game until you've got real players playing it. So it's better doing this on a small scale initially. I've seen many surprises at soft launch um, and even from sort of big studios. Um, so it really is, and again, I can't stress this enough, and I know I've said this maybe three times now, 
is that data is key. Really understand your players, um, being able to soft launch in, in, in smaller regions first and at learning from um, potential mistakes or gaps in the game first is, is, is really, really critical before you, you look at launching global, globally or, or scaling up your game. So if we go on to the kind of third point here, um, and we're talking about sort of long-term retention and engagement being uh, more important than basic revenue. Now, we've not really touched on, uh, on, on revenue uh, much in this talk, but I still think it's a very important uh, sort of takeaway here and, and something to note on. So obviously we know revenue is important. However, if you have good retention and engagement, monetization is a byproduct of this. On the flip side, if you prioritize monetization, retention and engagement is not a good byproduct of this. So again, this just goes back to proving the fundamentals, making sure that from the early kind of development phase, don't focus on monetization purely. Yes, it should be, uh, it shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be built in from the core, but you want to make sure that you're, you're building your game um, to be enjoyable, that it will retain players and, and be fun and engaging. Uh, and then revenue will follow. And then finally here, um, and I think this flows on quite well, just what I was saying there, um, and it's most really kind of the most important point of all is, is putting the player first. So it really goes without saying, but the best strategy is to, to have the player enjoyment at heart. Not specific to the games industry, being customer centric is, is really key across the board. Okay, so that's just, that's just done. So really thank you for attending this Unite Now session and thanks to, to Arkai uh, and Unico Studios for, for, for joining me uh, on this session. It's been really insightful and it's a pleasure to, to have you on uh, this call. Um, it's been, it's been a really, really good. Now, before we wrap up, um, just like to say we hope you've learned a lot to help build your Unity skills and advance your projects. And please feel free to provide us with, with feedback uh, if you've got any. And if you've launched a, launched a mobile game and you're looking for an extra boost to, to scale, please check out our newly launched game growth pro uh, program. Um, and this is a new game accelerator for, for mobile indie developers. Uh, and finally, um, be sure to check out our Unite Now page for other sessions in the Indie XP series uh, and more that are sure to inform and inspire you. Thanks very much.